and India, but I think both of us are going to be talking mainly about India, though Australia comes into it towards the end. And in that spirit of focusing in on India, I wanted to start by just offering a little sort of vignette from uh, the period when I was doing research in 2004 and 2005 in Meerut city, which, as most of you know, is about uh, 65 miles northeast of Delhi in western Uttar Pradesh. And at that time, I was doing research on student politics and youth cultures funded by the British government. I was a lecturer at the time at the University of Edinburgh, but was spending a year in Meerut doing interviews and participant observation, mainly with students, but also to some extent with, with staff, government officials, other members of society in Meerut. And I distinctly remember over that time walking from a little uh, flat apartment I was renting close to the centre of Meerut to Meerut College. And the experience of standing at Meerut College Gate. Now on one side of Meerut College Gate, there was the decrepit physics block of the, the college. And on the this physics block was scrawled, in need of an academic atmosphere, with academics, academics spelled wrong. Uh, and it was an area where students often um, congregated to, uh, in, in the um, words, of, in, in their own words, pass time, do time pass. On the other side of the college gate, however, there was another area uh, underneath a banyan tree where a different group of students would congregate. And it was a, an area of co constant conversation and political foment. And this area was associated particularly with a self-styled group of student reformers who called themselves Chingadi. Uh, Chingadi means spark in Hindi. And they were very involved in trying to address issues of corruption in the university and generally trying to make change within the university system in Mirda College and to some extent in the university to which Millet College was affiliated, Chaudhry Charan Singh University. So what I wanted to do today was uh, just in the 15 minutes that I have, just follow um, a, a little bit the story of the left side of the gate and the story of the right side of the gate. And in terms of thinking about the left side of the gate, I want to provide some context in terms of understanding the situation of Midland College in 2004 and 2005. And that means a brief history of some elements of higher education in India since the mid-19th century. And then I want to follow the Chingari group and just say, uh, and it will literally just be for five minutes, a little bit about student agency in Midland College and a little bit more broadly in Midland uh, as it emerged in 2004 and 2005. Then I'll hand over to Faisal who will talk more about the active role that some staff in universities and colleges in India are playing in terms of reform. And then we'll open it up for questions. So as many of you know, and this will be taking you, many of you through um, familiar territory, uh, modern universities in, with, with you know, heav heavily um, scare quotes around it are conventionally traced in the mid-19th century in India with the establishment of universities like Bombay and Calcutta and these universities were imagined as hubs that would play a civic function in uh, the development of pub uh, public education in their regions. And uh, a, a series of colleges began to be associated with those universities. And that model, that sort of model of the central university playing a larger role in its region uh, in the in, in post-independence period, uh, developed uh, at a very rapid rate. So in the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s in particular, you saw the emergence of an increasing number of universities in India that, were award that awarded degrees and that affiliated a whole range of other uh, government colleges and private colleges that were roughly in their region, certainly in their state. Uh, it was a sort of hub-and-spoke model and the university was imagined as the center of research. The, the colleges were more associated with teaching, although um, they also, in some cases, had a research function. Now, all of this varies a great deal regionally. So I'm, I'm not pretending that Uttar Pradesh can stand in for India. Uh, and, uh, and also, I should say, in summarizing how things emerged since the 1960s, there are obviously exceptions in terms of what I'm going to say in a moment. What is... Uh, uh, very, very clear, is that this system became huge as the 
higher education system which came to cater for increasing demand from parents and young people for education from the 1960s onwards. It, it mushroomed, so that now we have roughly 670 universities in India and over 40,000 colleges, either government or private. And a lot of that college growth has been in professional education, particularly engineering and medicine, and it's been in the private spheres, the private colleges, but affiliated to uh, a university. Now, most of the universities granting affiliation are state universities rather than central universities. So they're universities run by India's constituent state governments, reflecting the way in which education is dealt with in the constitution. And the state provide some funding for the state universities and for their constituent colleges. The state universities also receive funding from the colleges that they affiliate via the affiliation process. This system is huge. When I was doing work in 2004 and 2005, Mirat University, Chaudhry Charan Singh University, formerly known as Mirat University, the state university in the city, had on its books somewhere in the region of 340,000 students through its various affiliated colleges. And at that point, it had sort of 400 colleges affiliated to it. There are state universities in India now that have well over 1,000 colleges affiliated to them. So really vast numbers. Now, the main story in relation to these state universities and affiliated colleges is one of uh, decay and of a lack of quality. Uh, and again, I should stress there are exceptions, and we can take those up in questions. The, the system uh, is, it's a, it's a, it remains a hub and spoke system. Uh, it's very poorly funded and it's very poorly regulated. And I want to tease out five key problems. The first is that many of these universities have woeful facilities. The, the, the funding they do receive is, is almost hope almost wholly channeled into the payment of, of uh, salaries for, stuff, for teaching staff. Very few, uh, uh, very, very little money is, is channeled into facilities. And this is true also at the school level in India. Uh, the, ma many of the people I work with in Mirat talked about how the facilities in their, in their university or college should be thrown down a well. They were appalled at how um, how poor they were in that respect. The, the second problem is that the, the curricula are outdated. In some cases, curricula that emerged during clo the colonial period remain uh, in, in place. Um, and so there's, there's been a very little curricular review or oversight over questions of pedagogy. Growth learning remains um, uh, characteristic of how many students learn. There's a lack of a research culture, so very few of the academic staff in colleges and even in the state universities are research active. There's very little interdisciplinarity, partly because there aren't the structures, the institutional structures to facilitate interdisciplinary research on areas that require uh, you know, an economist, a political scientist, a meteorologist, for example, in the case of pollution or climate change. And partly actually because there isn't the respect for uh, humanities and social sciences, which tend to be relegated in the minds of many students and staff uh, in terms of the a, a, a disciplinary hierarchy. And as a result of that, the, as a result of the lack of research culture, very few of these universities and colleges have the kinds of links to industry that are characteristic of universities in many other parts of the world. Corruption is a major problem in this, uh, as I said, decayed hub and spoke model. So a lot of the work I did in 2004 and 2005 was about understanding the, the, the forms of rent seeking that were taking place within the university sector, the market in terms of getting access to no objection certificates to establish a private college in Mirat, the, the process of the, the, the um, corrupt process through which affiliations were granted by the university, the um, the processes of land acquisition and uh, illegality and corruption surrounding land, the processes of illegal admissions, the illegal charging of so-called capitation fees at colleges and universities. A, a vast array of forms of uh, corruption that reflect the point that universities poorly funded but at the same time the government uh, heavily regulates this sector, creating all these honeypots uh, for 
regional elites and their local lackeys to make money. <coughs> and finally, uh, and related very much to that point about rent seeking, the, the, this provincial uh, university system in India of, of, of um, uh, state universities and affiliated colleges is very highly politicized. So uh, appointments to vice chancellorships, senior appointments within universities, uh, in many cases appointments to private colleges and public colleges are made on the basis of cronyism and personal considerations rather than with respect to technical merit. This is the tip of the iceberg. I could talk till <laughs> seven in the evening about um, these issues, but I wanted to give you a, a taste of what I see as some of the key um, problems. There are, of course, um, to, to be balanced against this, some positive developments, uh, and I'll run through these very quickly. The Indian government it, it is much more interested in the reform of higher education now than when I was working in Delhi in the mid-1990s, early 2000s and mid-2000s. This is reflected in the recent move to, to create institutions of eminence, which I'll skim over, but which we can talk about in questions, and also in the encouragement that's been given to expanding the system of Indian Institutes of Technology, the IITs, which are central universities rather than state universities, uh, but which are now um, proliferating across India. Uh, 16 of, of the existing 22 IITs were established in the last 12 years. In terms of positive de developments, I also want to mention the rise of so-called elite private universities funded often philanthropically, which have a degree of autonomy from uh, both the state government and from the central government. I'm thinking about universities like Ashoka, La like Shivnada, Azam Premji University, OP Jindal University, some of these you'll be intimately familiar with. The, in, in these universities, there is a sort of resurgence of liberal arts education uh, and uh, pockets of excellence. And in terms of being optimistic about possibilities for reform and, and dynamism within the university system in, in India, uh, and, and the main thing we want to talk about over the next 45 minutes, so first of all, that students are not the passive victims of these um, systems of higher education. They are, like the Chingali, involved in trying to um, reform from within, and that, to some extent, is also true of staff. And I want to, uh, I put those in different colours on the um, PowerPoint. I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm the orange person, about student agency, and if I put you in and purple and staff there we um, go. agency. <laughs> And, and I want to say some things, again, sort of very much um, uh, schematically as a basis for conversation about student agency. And the first thing to say, and, it, and it's a, a footnote to the point I was making about rent seeking, is that a lot of the students that I work with in MIRA were directly or indirectly involved in the systems of corruption that I described in relation to higher education. So they were often go-betweens in relationships between private educational entrepreneurs and the university administration. They were quite often involved in illegal land sales. They were involved through their roles in the student union in brokering relationships between college entrepreneurs and politicians. And they made money from those positions. And uh, some of them went on, as we've shown in, in uh, more recent work, to become college entrepreneurs. And I should mention that I'm working closely here with Stephen Young a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Professor Satendra Kumar, who works at G.P. Pant Institute in Lahabad around the afterlife of student politics in Meerut, and we're, we're going to be doing future research on that as well. Having said that, there are also a, a lot of people who are trying to engage in various forms of anti-corruption work. Now, some of those are formal protests and involve the, the establishment of institutions, but one of the key characteristics of that work is that it happens necessarily under the radar. It happens through people trying to uh, petition senior members of, 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 of uh, universities to prevent illegal admissions, to grant scholarships to people uh, that are legally uh, on the books. It, it happens through them trying to involve the district magistrate or the subdivisional magistrate in, um, in aspects of the of university operating. It, it involves a kind of con constant hustle, which they do partly um, as a, uh, on um, philanthropic grounds as part of a, a sense of social service, and partly sometimes also as a result of a desire to build up a portfolio of examples of their anti-corruption activity that can be useful in terms of getting positions in representative government later. So they're hitching personal interest to a type of public service. 
and I talk quite a lot in the book Time Pass, and I've been following some of these people later, about people who, who do, do one thing with the left hand and one thing with the right hand. So they're involved in anti-corruption on the one hand, on the, uh, on the other hand they're doing deals with the Vice Chancellor over uh, illegal admissions to a college. And I don't think that's surprising at all, uh, but can, can talk about that, that a little bit, bit more in a moment. A lot of this work is happening across historical boundaries, it's happening across caste, class, and gender boundaries. And a lot of it involves uh, various forms of research. So one of the things I found that was very interesting about doing this work in MIDA was that rather than working on young people and student politics, I was working with them in trying to understand how the university operated in obtaining uh, information, sorting information, disseminating information carefully. Uh, and that sense of joining an interpretive community rather than working on a student population is something that I want to thread through future work on this way in which students are kind of, in E.P. Thompson's terms, warning from within in trying to reform higher education. So I'm going to pass over to, to Faisal having said those things and, um, and then we'll go to questions. Faisal. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just as um, uh, 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 Craig's work is largely focused on uh, uh, students, my work uh, has in recent years been focused on academic work. Uh, um, and the work that academics do, staff. Um, now, this varies greatly from univers university to university and uh, uh, layers of uh, the system to another layer. Uh, varies greatly from um, state and uh, central universities. Uh, central universities do academic work, which is actually quite recognizably similar to what we do here at the University of Melbourne. But state universities work in ways that are radically different. And those people who are employed in colleges, uh, spokes, if you like, uh, that varies uh, um, even more so. And I want to talk about some of the things that I found out in my various trips to India and various trips to uh, both central and state universities and uh, also colleges. So, uh, as far as the state universities are concerned, until recently, there were very few incentives for them to do research and publish, especially at the state universities, as I said. Hardly any, in fact, uh, uh, at colleges, it is positively discouraged. Uh, um, they're largely focused on teaching and preparing students uh, for examinations, the colleges are. And as a result, uh, um, their engagement with the community is very limited. The people that they refer to, mostly in relation to defining the nature of their work, are the examination um, uh, entities and people who come and oversee their work, audit their work uh, from the universities themselves. So that there is very complicated relationship between uh, the central university uh, faculty and the faculty at the level of colleges. So, uh, 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 and this relationship really ought to be studied much more than I think it has been because it is a source of a great deal of anxiety at one level, uh, various possibilities another, and uh, frankly, a little bit of corruption as well uh, in relation to the relationship uh, in this hub and scope model that uh, uh, Craig has talked about. Now, the system of affiliated colleges uh, can actually be seen as a possible mechanism, but also a major barrier to contribute to public good. I don't think we can assume that uh, the college system, the affiliated system, is necessarily inimical to public good. In fact, uh, their size, their location, and their proximity to their communities opens up a huge range of possibilities that we should not ignore. And yet, the ways in which uh, the work is structured and the expectations that uh, the central university or the, uh, the, center, the organizing, affiliating university has of them gives them very little room to do that work, uh, despite the fact that many faculty that I have talked to at the colleges have a great deal of interest in expanding the nature of their work beyond preparing students for the examinations that are set by the central universities and doing something more in relation to the communities. Uh, of course, the number of affiliated colleges to meet the very rapidly growing and increasing demand has uh, is, is been is been well noted, uh, indeed so much so that uh, now something like uh, um, uh, ninety percent of the undergraduate students in India, uh, in the late from the latest figures, 
are enrolled in colleges uh, that are affiliated to a university. You know, the 90%, that's a very large. And at the postgraduate level, it's 72.2%. So basically, much of the educational work in higher education in India gets done at the colleges rather than at the universities. And as we develop relationship with the universities, we mustn't forget that we are looking at a very, very small slice of higher education system rather than the system. Of course, it is possible for us to look at re research these things by seeing how the universities, the affiliating universities, relate to the affiliated colleges. Uh, uh, and I think uh, that is something that uh, is well worth thinking about. Until recently, until the state was split into two, Telangana and, uh, and uh, Andhra, um, uh, in the Andhra Pradesh days, Osmania University was the largest university with affiliated colleges, something like 1,200. Currently, Osmania University, which is in Hyderabad, has 500 plus affiliated colleges. In education, this is around 300. Now, the affiliated colleges are run by educational societies, philanthropic trust, many of them established by um, uh, politicians who failed to uh, uh, win the seats uh, that they once occupied. Uh, it's almost like a, a trajectory that appears to be there where you lose your seat and you almost go immediately to establish in your name a private college uh, linked to. Exactly how these universities, these colleges get affiliated, the manner in which they do it, what are the processes, the governance processes that are involved is unclear. And uh, it's unclear largely because it varies from state to state. Uh, Bihar, it's much easier to get uh, affiliated, affiliated to a university in uh, Karnataka is a little more difficult. Uh, uh, so this is state legislation that defines how uh, colleges get affiliated and who is affiliated and what are the responsibilities. Uh, now some of these colleges are government aided. Uh, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Osmania, 50 out of 500 colleges are government aided. The rest of them are entirely private with no government uh, university involvement, although they may get some money from other sources uh, within, the, within the state. Uh, um, I have actually been thinking about these colleges as almost like a franchise system, where the brand is yours, but the work is done at uh, the local shop, owned by somebody completely different. Uh, exactly whether that analogy works or not, yeah, is something that I'm still not sure about. Uh, but I've been thinking about uh, the extent to which uh, this system can be represented in franchise terms or in terms of PPPP, or PPP, uh, public-private uh, partnership. Uh, that is, the public university with private institutions. Uh, so 80% of students go to private institutions in India, 80%, which is one of the highest in the world, actually, uh, once you take into it. And yet the degrees that they get are 80% from public universities. Uh, so it's the other way around almost. 80% uh, attend uh, private institutions but get degrees from public universities and the other way around. And that actually is really quite interesting. Now, what I've been actually focusing on is the role of the university in Osmania in particular, which is celebrating its centenary this year. It was established in, 80, in 1918 is to coordinate academic standards through curriculum development, regulation of teaching standards, and evaluation of students through various audits. In other words, the universities set the exams, they establish the curriculum, they even prescribe the textbooks to be used, and they do much of the work of setting up the system, which is simply implemented at the level of, uh, of uh, the processes of audit are clearly very, very uneven and do sometimes involve corruption, where money changes uh, um, hand uh, as a way of getting the tick for a college to continue to be affiliated. For many staff, the work um, has become incredibly onerous. So in the Faculty of Education, there were 17 members uh, of uh, faculty, uh, eight of them had responsibility 
for looking after the auditing work of these colleges, about 300 of them, okay, various degree colleges and so on. So. And they said they're constantly on the road. Now remember, the work that I did was before Andhra Pradesh became split. Uh, so they were going long distances uh, uh, to actually uh, talk to the owners, talk to the teachers, uh, making sure that their students were following the rules in relation to examinations and things like this. So basically they were becoming almost like the examination house. And one of them said to them, we have been reduced to examination houses. In other words, uh, we are no, not academic. We are administrating a very complicated exam system. Um, the other nine people were able to do some research, but even those people were implicated in the work of the colleges by developing the curriculum, setting the, setting, setting the textbooks and all those sort of things. Uh, so the, the, the system is really, really complicated. Uh, and of course, uh, more recently, the government has recognized that at the central level, at the level of Delhi, HRD, and indeed there is a major program called RUSA, R-U-S-E, which stands for Rashtriya Uchar Shiksha Abhiyan, um, which is, sorry about my pronunciation, it's very Sanskritized word. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, but they have actually decided that the system is just not working and something needs to be done. And yet, to abandon the system it is, has been recognized as an, uh, as an impossibility. It is so deeply entrenched and so clearly defining the system of higher education that it can only be improved at the edges. Uh, one of the proposals has been what's called bifurcation and trifurcation of universities. So large universities are becoming bifurcated into two universities, almost like a federal university, with the university University of Kanpur, for example, having two universities, two vice chancellors, two sets of uh, organizing um, uh, mechanisms through which uh, colleges are, because the numbers have grown and are continuing to grow. So in many ways, uh, the system was established when there was simply something like 10 to 15 colleges affiliated. But when you get 1,000 colleges affiliated, you're looking at not only something that ch changes in terms of its quantity, but qualitatively as well. And I think those are the kind of issues that are becoming. And yet, um, Indian higher education researchers have not devoted all that much time to study this complicated relationship, study the ways in which uh, the relationship is formed, uh, enacted, and indeed evaluated, and the extent to which uh, it is either effective or indeed hugely ineffective. In, in, in ineffective. So the mammoth universities, these big universities, some of them with more than one, mi one million students, once you, ca once you count all the people, uh, all the colleges that are affiliated to them, is really something uh, quite interesting. Now, the question that I think Craig and I are interested in is to what extent these new elite private universities have the capacity to break through, cut through this particular morass. Okay? Um, to what extent is it possible for new structures to emerge that uh, uh, simply, uh, that, that they do different kind of organizational and governance work and they actually work so differently that the academic work is so radically defined away from managing examination system to actually doing teaching and research and publishing and all those sort of things. So, so um, from my perspective, uh, that, that's the key question. And I think Craig is going to finish off by saying something like what kind of future research uh, we might do in relation to this. So, so uh, thank you, Faisal. Just, just to um, uh, piggyback on what Faisal just said, I think one of the, one of the um, areas where we think there could be potential for some really interesting applied research, so not we need information, but we're thinking about research that would also have a, a, a high degree of practical value or potential value, is to try to partner with some of the elite private universities that are emerging that are already trying to think about how to improve education, especially higher education in their region. So I'm thinking we're thinking about organi uh, organizations like Shivnada University, Ashoka University, Symbiosis University in Pune, uh, and, and see how they're reaching out to college principals, to state university vice chancellors, 
to staff, faculty in those uh, in the provincial universities and provincial colleges, and the students in the provincial universities and, univer and colleges to connect with the Chingari that I mentioned, to try to improve, if we were to put it in sort of grand academic terms, regional educational ecosystems. So this could involve, on the one hand, research on the, 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 the engagement practices of the uh, private universities, the way in which they're sort of thinking about region and their, and their accountability or responsibility to the regions in which they're located. So for Ashoka in Sonipat in Haryana, that might be Haryana or a portion of Haryana. But it also, I think, means doing much more research, as, as Faisal said, in the context of a lack of, of sort of qualitative material on what's actually happening inside this university system. But it also means doing some research with staff and students, looking at what's already going on within institutions under the radar in terms of efforts at, at reform. And again, I sort of come back to that idea of, sort of entering into an interpretive community rather than doing work on um, staff or students. Uh, and and, uh, and, and I, I think the, the last piece I'd, I'd emphasise there is that we are in a university here at the University of Melbourne that has put a lot of effort, I think, in the last three to five years into thinking about how it engages with its region as a means to create public value or create the public good, which of course is lots sort of lovely honeyed words, uh, but actually I think they're doing it as well in lots of really interesting ways. Now some of that involves thinking about, I think, sort of accountability to place, so place-based engagement, thinking about what it means to be at precisely this longitude and latitude, what's it mean to be located in Parkville or, or Carlton, what, what does it mean uh, to be in this position in Victoria, what kind of relationships can one establish in terms of links with the community that are reciprocal, it's not about outreach or um, sort of dissemination, it's about joint working with different community groups in a particular kind of region. How could that kind of place-based model of engagement be a basis for talking to universities like Ashoka or Shivnada that are trying to also develop place-based engagement strategies in its educational hinterland? Very much, again, thinking about two-way learning. What, what are the challenges that Ashoka faces in organizing seminars for college principals from Haryana? What are the challenges that the University of Melbourne faces in its links, for example, to Shepparton, where it works particularly with diverse uh, and, and uh, the, the indigenous community? So it's a different way of thinking about international engagement from high-level research collaboration and undergraduate recruitment. But it could be the basis, I think, for some very interesting conversations. So it's really sort of thinking about three things. That, the, the investigating the guts of the university, the staff, the students, possibly also the administrators, and their role in moderating or reforming the institutions, the role of some of these new actors, the private universities, Pratap Banumitu is the vice chancellor of Ashoka University, he's uh, you know, an accomplished academic in his own right of, of higher education in India, and thirdly, the potential for universities across the world, including the University of Melbourne, that are interested in place-based engagement, engaging in conversation with uh, Indian universities that are also trying to do this thing, rubbing your tummy and patting your head. You're trying to move up the rankings, have this global reputation, but, you, but also internal to the university is the notion that universities should be serving a wider public, they receive public money, and have this, uh, this responsibility to place. So I think at that point we'll open it up for questions. We'll both sit down and make it conversational. Um, I don't think we have a moderator, but uh, just to get, go like that. Um, there's a question there. Well, maybe I will moderate, right? So there's a question there. Question here. Yeah. Um, so I had a two-point question with the student and the staff agency. So uh, as I see it, as you mentioned in Mirror, there were students that you were interacting with who on one hand were involved in anti-corruption movements and on the other hand were brokering deals. I wonder how their incentives would be shaped to be engaged into activities that are in, in their face contradictory. Um, and also, uh, since I have been a part of a public university and a private college, as you mentioned, um, I wonder how reform works really because to look at it in a theoretical approach, it would be easy considering it's a centralized system. Sure. But a lot of universities just do it for the ratings. As in Mumbai University, they actually just 
uh, when the university officials are arriving, they do a certain bit of work to get the rating and then everything goes away. And how does the relationship of a university level officer and a college level professor work uh, in what constitutes reform? Should I start on the, you know, the sort of the double dealing? I, mean, I, I, I talk about it at length in the, in the penultimate chapter of a book I wrote called Time Pass, and, and part of that discussion is around, a lot of that discussion is around how they justify what they're doing. And, and one of the ways that they, that they rationalize it is that in the short term, it's necessary for them to make money from their social and political influence in the context of pervasive unemployment. So if you've got a good link with the registrar and you can get a 10% cut of the three illegal admission places into a local engineering college, you just need to do it because <laughs> you're not going to get a government job. But it's in their long-term interest and the interests of other generations of students coming after them to try to improve the system. So it's a, a narrative around short-term interests versus long-term goals. Uh, there's, there's other arguments there as well um, that, that are, are interesting. People say that you know, it's, it's, it's all right um, to be involved in, in corruption, which is where there's a known price for certain kinds of resources, like 50,000 to get entry into that law course in Muir College. What's unacceptable is fraud, which is where you pay a bribe and something still doesn't happen. So these students would say, well, this is a, in, in James Scott's 1972 article on corruption, this is market corruption. There's a known amount of money that's associated with different um, resources. It's not parochial corruption, which is where, you know, if, if, if you're a Dalit, it will cost you 100,000. But if, if Simon's a, a Brahmin, it'll only cost him 20,000. And Trent is my best friend, it won't cost him anything. So they would argue that, the, you know, corruption is a system of morality and honesty and that they're relatively honest brokers within a system which they didn't create and which in the long term they'd like to change. I think the point that I would make is that the Indian government is absolutely aware of some of these problems, okay? So what we are saying is not entirely new, you know, and uh, original. Um, the RUSA, the program, and I've talked to one or two people who work for that, you know, and they're sort of saying, absolutely, you know, everything that you've said is not unknown to us. Uh, the question is, how do you break through? Especially with the kind of problem that you're talking about, where it's an old inspector system that we in education know quite well, the, uh, the, the inspector system. When the inspector comes and everything is spruced up, and the day after it goes back to the, 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 the original chaos, you know? Um, that's, that's um, I think uh, the salaries have improved, by the way, considerably, okay? Um, uh, not that cost of living hasn't also gone up in places like uh, uh, Mumbai and all those sort of things, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the incentive to necessarily rely and make your living on the on the corruption is been taken away to a certain extent, not entirely, but uh, um, so so the Indian government is doing quite a bit actually, um, and this particular program, Rusa, is really quite a significant think tank which is thinking about these issues. Uh, the biggest problem is. Uh, the size, okay, the number of affiliated colleges. I think affiliated colleges where there are only 15 attached to a university could actually work reasonably well, okay, uh, within a locality. But when you have colleges scattered all over the place, uh, in some unknown places unknown to the faculty themselves at the central university, then it just becomes a sham actually, and I think that's the problem. So the responsibilities of the universities are considerable in legislative terms and in terms of, uh, you know, the, well, what, uh, what is written down as to, I mean, uh, the list at uh, Osmani University of the number of things that the university agrees to do is about 20 things, you know, from developing the concept, setting the textbook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is no way that they can do it. No way, none. Actually, if we were suddenly required to do that here at the University of Melbourne, we wouldn't be able to do it because we just don't have the time and don't have the, the resources, etc., etc. So the question becomes, uh, um, how do you make the hub and spoke uh, really, really radically rethink the hub and spoke model, you know, which has become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the extent that it is bursting at the seams? Okay. Question here. Yeah. Yes, I think, like you're 
central universities and state universities mm -hmm. is a big difference. Yes. Because state universities were actually established originally during the British rule. So they were more or less designed in the old British system. But the British education system has gone further. They have introduced all the new research that come into how it's hard to introduce courses and all that. But those state universities, they stayed at the same states. They did not introduce any new reform or anything like that. But the central universities are very, very, very new. They have picked up more or less the American system. So like IITs, IIT when they started, they started with the MIT curriculum, an MIT system of semi-structure, same American semester systems. So those two are very different. And the second thing is in state universities, the funding is a big problem. Because you know, state government hardly got any fund. Yeah. So that is why they cannot do any research. Yeah. That's one thing. And second thing is the staff quality also is very low. Mm. So that is another problem. But question is, as you say, all these affiliated colleges, yeah. that I think India cannot get out of it. Yeah. Because India has a huge population. Sure. And to cater for all these students, you have got no mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But you have to have those colleges. Mm -hmm. But the main problem is, mm -hmm. because of the funding, the university, number of universities have not increased. Mm -hmm. As you are suggesting, that if the university has got, say, about 100 mm -hmm. colleges, then it can function, or say 50 colleges. But now, as you say, someone has got 1,000 or 500. Mm -hmm. So necessarily, they've gone completely out of control. So well, I think that government has to put in more money and establish more universities so you know, their workload get distributed. Well, one of the proposals that has been suggested is to actually bring 15 of these colleges and create a university. So instead of sort of, um, and, and then, in, in other words, uh, make much smaller universities than yeah. these 1.5 million right. universities. Yes. But that is a very, very expensive deal. I mean, they've considered that quite seriously. And also, given the prestige and status and uh, uh, power interests are linked to these issues, uh, especially at different state levels, it is much more difficult to imagine even how it might be realized. So I think there is a problem. The other thing that I wanted to say, it's, it's, it's actually misleading to suggest that all central universities uh, uh, are, 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 are the same. So for example, um, uh, IITs are very different beasts to, to B, B, BHU and AMU and uh, mm -hmm. Allahabad and, uh, you know, these are central universities too, you know, but they are very different kind of central universities to IITs. Yeah, another thing I think I want to say is like your suggesting uh, going to the private universities. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea, so if you can pick up some very good private universities, mm -hmm. this, this, again, there's a series of private universities. Some of them are really very good, as you said, started by good academic yeah, people. Yeah. And some of them have started by business people, yeah. more on business money. So if you can pick up some very good, <coughs> you know, like Vinda Institute of Technology or Manipal, yeah. they are, I think, doing very um, good. Can I actually just finish off a point about that? Yeah. One of the big problems that is now already emerging is some of the best staff, some of the most committed staff from state and even central universities are now moving across to private universities because they have better reputations, yes, because they have better facilities, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that just India, India is one of those things, one of those places where each reform that you think, ah, this is going to work, there is always a downside. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Oh, thank you. That was a very interesting presentation. I was wondering, uh, amidst this discontent with the Robin Spoke model, where does this entire uh, sort of idea of deemed university, which, which has also caused many, uh, raised many questions yeah. and probably answer some questions, uh, answer some questions in India. So where does this idea of deemed university or so-called autonomous colleges, yeah. so for instance, I come from a college which, is, which just had 500 students and yes. it's for all purposes just single discipline, one college, yeah, yeah. but it's a university. Yeah. And mm -hmm. in many senses, the idea of university in India is for this sort of professional institutes, which are just single discipline colleges, has reduced to a legal category more than anything else. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just means basically something that gives you more autonomy if you're called a university rather than a college. Yeah, yeah. And uh, some people see this as a solution, but some people also have problems with it. There was yeah. a few years ago, around 100 deemed universities were sort of, their, their registration was canceled. And I'm sort of wondering within this whole yeah, model yeah. and this new private universities, that there's something lying in between and how do you see that? Well, some of the deemed universities emerged out of the colleges, uh, 
you know, okay, so they were once college of a University of Calcutta or something like that, and uh, then they suddenly were given the deemed status. So, so the relationship is very close one. Um, I mean, deemed universities uh, or un deemed in ent institutions, as you said, have got their own problems, you know, because uh, at one level they are autonomous, but at another level they're still very dependent on uh, the university upon which, uh, out of which they emerged, and quite often they don't have enough uh, uh, in the way of resources, in the way of uh, expertise, to be able to do that. Uh, I mean, I think we've got to actually accept the fact that India and perhaps other countries too are going to have very specialized single subject, single discipline, single university, single industry universities. Uh, that's going to happen. So, you know, we mustn't get hung up by the idea of pneumonia, Newman's idea, Cardinal Newman's idea, or Humboldtian idea of a university, and actually imagine new formations that define university, and not sort of saying, uh, this is what university is, you know. Different places will do different kind of things, you know. And I think some of them are going to be very small, and some of them are going to be much larger. Uh, so as a result, the various gradations uh, will Im inevitably emerge. Uh, but how and why okay, uh, they might develop in a productive kind of way is a question that still remains to be resolved. Right, so we've got quite a few questions. I suggest right. we try okay, maybe take a few. stack of them and then, right. and then make some final um, observations. So Amanda, Bob, and then Jeff, and then we could probably take a couple more and then we'll respond. Amanda. Uh, Craig, you mentioned the announcement of the institutions of eminence as a yeah. kind of positive move, but most of the chatter I've heard around that has been quite negative. And I think it points to a broader issue of the potential for private institutions to be kind of, uh, uh, for government and private institutions to be in relationships that are going out so positive. So could you say something about the institutions of eminence in particular and the, the potential pitfalls of this kind of private <laughs> PPP system. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, well, oh, thank you. Um, last year I had the uh, fortune, good fortune to visit uh, a, um, a college, a uh, large established regional university, BHU, and a newly established uh, central university in the centre of Rajasthan. And what struck me in each of the interactions was the hunger of the mainly Hindi speaking students for exposure to people who brought a different perspective, uh, albeit in the English language. In one place I was explicitly invited on the basis, my students only speak Hindi, I'm a Hindi professor, I want them to hear a lecture in English. Uh, so there's a hunger there. The second thing was, the hunger was in some cases constrained uh, by lack of knowledge uh, beyond the immediate context of the university. And thirdly, the um, impression I had was that despite the university bureaucracy, despite the uh, opaque issues of uh, management that you've been talking about so nicely, uh, there is a hunger by some of the staff to do something. So yes. my question is, to what extent is it possible to find feasible ways of feeding the student hunger and feeding the um, enthusiasm of the staff who as individuals are saying, hey, uh, we are here, we have responsibilities, we want to do better than we're doing. <laughs> Thanks, good. Um, Jeff. Yeah, so, um, this was um, a really wide-ranging presentation, but one thing that I wanted to hear more about was the issue of uh, university or college governance. So there was a lot of discussion about the organization, the hub and spoke model, also resources, but with both of those, whether you keep those models or you perform them, you still need, a, I think, a robust governance system. And I think this goes also to the question of number, or the, the fourth question, the investigation of how Australian universities could partner. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are models of, of governance in Australia or in the United States, which I'm more familiar, which are more or less successful um, with you know, university governance. Um, and it also um, uh, seems that this is an issue these would be private universities in India and also elsewhere in South Asia, out South Asia. I'd be curious as to whether the most successful ones are the ones that are the organized the best or have the most resources or have the most robust forms of, of, of 
of governance. I, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't know, but I suspect that some of the failures of private universities, and there are many, many, many failures of the private universities, um, don't really relate to organization or, or resources, but relate to governance um, and, and staff and student voice in that governance. If there isn't, aren't any more other questions or comments, can I, Fazer, do you mind me just say three things really Please quickly? Please do. <laughs> the, the, the first, of, and this so variously cuts across some, some of the questions, the first was responding to your, your, your comment about funding. I think it's a catastrophe wrapped in a crisis. 5% of India's research and development budget goes into universities, which is very low internationally, pitifully low. And within that 5%, the vast majority goes to central universities. Very little filters down to the places where, as Faisal said, 90% you know, or 94% of the students study. That's a huge problem and, and one that needs to be addressed. I, I think the, the problem of, the second thing I'd say is I think the problem of provincial higher education in India is what Michael Tausig would call a public secret. It's this thing that everybody knows but nobody really wants to talk about. And it's something that's so huge that the, the response within India, and certainly from you know, well-intentioned you know, statements like, like we're making from outside India, is, is sort of, well, it's, it's too big a problem to solve. You know, throw up your hands. Um, and, 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 there's, and also, you know, it's a very politically complex problem. There's so much vested interest. One of the reasons there wasn't more opposition to liberalization in India was precisely because the, the education sector, like the health sector, like the, electricity, like the electricity sector, is a patronage democracy, where regional elites have lots of opportunities to make very large sums of money. And what Pfizer said about the politicians going into college, you think there's 40,000 colleges, there's a lot of people making a lot of money out of this system. So that comes to the point um, in answer to Amanda's question about the institutes of eminence. The danger is that the central government just plays around with a few pet projects. Now, uh, I, I don't think the Institute of Eminence is a pet project. I think it's actually a, an, an effort to try and think big about how to, to reform higher education in India. It, it's, it's narrowed. Originally, it was going to be, you know, one stage was going to be 100, then it's going to be 20, and now it's six. Now, of course, when you pick six institutions of, institutes of eminence, a whole series of political considerations come into play. We shouldn't be surprised about that. Still, it is surprising that one of the institutes that was chosen, uh, Geo University, doesn't yet exist. It's an on-paper application, uh, and it reflects the influence of Ambani on the Indian government, surely. Uh, it, it, it was, they say, a very promising application. Nevertheless, uh, if I was you know, the Vice Chancellor of JNU or Delhi University, I would be sort of slightly, slightly so yeah, think concerned that Geo University rose to the surface. Um, so, so, so there are certain problems, but I think it does at least suggest a, a sort of spirit of reform and, a, and, a, and a, a, a kind of energy around taking on this public secret that certainly during some phases of, of the post-independence period hasn't been um, evident. And, and on the governance and the question around staff, um, I, I think it's probably do, taking that two or three steps back from this, important to point out that, that faculty in provincial universities are generally positioned in the higher education literature as the problem, or a major part of the problem. Yeah. Because they're very heavily unionized, they're very influential politically, as are the principals and the vice chancellors, and they have a stake in the status quo. So if I'm a physics professor at Mirror University, I've got a basement that looks like this, and it's raked. It's got seats like this, and that's where I give my uh, lectures. To you, fee-paying students, you pay me a private tuition fee for that instruction, which I should be providing publicly in the college itself. And I can prevent anyone trying to close down that tutorial model because of my political influence and my influence on the union. That's not to say everyone's doing that. Of course, there's excellent people in the system, lots of excellent people in the system trying to, trying to uh, work to reform it. But there's also a lot of people uh, in, the, in the context of unionism uh, who are defending the system as it, as it exists at the moment. So, Fazal. Um, Jeff, uh, about uh, the issue of uh, governance, uh, it really is interesting because uh, uh, when I did this work uh, in Hyderabad, uh, I went to a number of colleges uh, and, uh, uh, and I have to say, there was no uniformity, no consistency in the ways in which these colleges were governed. You know, I tried to actually sort of say, what is common in the ways in which they are organized, you know, uh, so that uh, those patterns can be replicated elsewhere. None, it's actually none. Uh, I went to about seven colleges, okay, so that's not many, but nonetheless sufficient to get. 
Um, I remember going to one college where faculty sort of said, I said to them, how is this place run? He said, so, he said to me something that I've never forgotten. He said, the person who is the principal, they didn't call them vice chancellors, who is the principal and the owner and the, 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 the chair of the advisory board, okay, all of them, same person, uh, is the zamindar. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> he used the word zamin there. So they're saying this is this is this is a this is a feudally run institution, you know, and uh, as a result, uh, the there is not enough being taught about about good governance uh, of these inst educational institutions, which are organised differently to the corporations or to the companies or the privately run companies. So I think that's really quite a huge issue. As far as the enemies is concerned, I think um, a number of my colleagues at JNU say that that is already a failed experiment. Uh, you know, that, uh, that, uh, so that there's, there's not even a, 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 a debate about whether that's likely to work or not. Uh, they, they basically sort of say, there's a guy called Drew Brenner, who I talked to, who's, who's a, very good, a very good scholar at the global level. Um, he said to me last time I was, I was talking to him, he sort of said, uh, they've got to go back to the drawing board and think about eminence again, you know, because the model that they developed uh, is so, so very heavily politicized uh, that nothing good is going to come out of it. But that's his view, okay? <laughs> All right. We, we are over time. I just wanted to say, because it's the question mark series, th thank you to the question marks um, organizers, particularly Trent for organizing this, this session and, yeah. and the education track. Um, since it is question marks as well, and the question was, uh, how can universities contribute to the public good in India? I think, and Faisal, you can uh, annotate this, but I think we're saying three things. We need more research. We need new kinds of conversations across sectoral international boundaries. And we also need to tap into the energies of people inside the system who are working uh, in difficult point. circumstances to reform. Yeah. And that's, his, that's precisely the point that I was going to make in relation to Bob's comment, you know. Um, I have been to these colleges where there's, there's considerable energy, but there's considerable cynicism as well oh, at absolutely. the same time, absolutely. you know. And uh, as, a, as a result, uh, how do you harness the enthusiasm uh, against, uh, at times, overwhelming sense of cynicism? Okay, that's, that, that's, where, that's where the thing is. And I think that o doesn't only require structural reforms, it requires cultural reform as well within the university and their governances. Thank you, everyone. Sorry. Thank you.